Good afternoon. I'm Elliot Coleman, and I've been asked to introduce these fine people because I got to know Dan and the Rockefeller family's involvement with food through the Stone Barn Center. In the 90s, the Rockefeller family had the goal of making the beauty and the agriculture heritage of their old dairy farm accessible to the public in hopes of establishing a dynamic campus of farmers, chefs, and educators. They partnered with chef Dan Barber to run a restaurant on the site. But first off, they brought together an amazing array of food and agriculture personalities for a couple of weekends of fascinating discussions of the possibilities. It was quite obvious that interest in food and agriculture was alive and well in the 90s. I was eventually engaged as a consultant for the organic farming aspects. I was privileged to work with David's father and the very caring and talented group of specialists who put all the parts together. When I noticed that the landscaping plan called for placing parking areas near the buildings on areas that were lush pastures made fertile by generations of grazing livestock, I insisted that all that fertile cop soil be carefully removed stockpiled until it could be used to supplement the soil of the half-acre greenhouse that was being built. If you ever visit the stone barns, and I encourage you to do so, you will be blown away by the quality of the vegetables in that greenhouse. And it is also a unique greenhouse because it has a design where the roof panels open fully so natural rainfall can be included as much as possible. The farm grows over 60 types of vegetables in both field and greenhouse. And because of the respectability given to organic farming by association with the stone barns, uh, they have successfully partnered with Cornell and other universities mm. to study why organic practices work so successfully. There is an annual Young Farmers Conference that's held at the Stone Barns, and it's so popular that the participants have had to be selected by lottery. And it continues to provide critical information on tools and techniques to the new generation of organic farmers who will be feeding the future. Now, I'm just gonna end by telling you a wonderful little it's tough work, but somebody has to do it story. On many days during the development phase when my presence was required on the site, I would get an early flight from Bangor to LaGuardia, and Dan would pick me up at the airport. There was no flight back north until 9.30 in the evening. So at the end of the day, Dan would take me back into the city, sit me at the bar at his Blue Hill restaurant and disappear into the kitchen to cook. Dan, whose simple food preparation, I always thought makes the food taste even fresher when he is finished than it did at the moment it was harvested, would then send out one delicious plate after another, mm. for which the bartender would look over and then pour the perfect complimentary wine <laughs> and that went on until the taxi arrived to take me to the airport. Best consulting job I ever had. <laughs> well, Dan Barber and Susan and David Rockefeller had continued to be involved in more food and agriculture projects than I can count. So let us welcome them to this final session of Good Food and Food Fights so we can hear their story. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Elliot. Is this working? Yeah, okay, good. And thank you, Elliot, for your wonderful help uh, at the beginning of Stone Barns. It was invaluable. And welcome and for the beginning of my career. I would have uh, made it through yet another surprise snowstorm. I mean, it wasn't snow, was it? It was just rain. Uh, 
but and this is the last I believe session for the Summer Institute so uh, thanks for sticking with it and being with us I'm going to play the role of moderator and hello Dan it's great to see your hello. face out there fantastic yeah. to have you with I'm us so, I'm so sorry I'm not in Maine to, to be next to you well it's beautiful and I'm it's sitting here in my you. bunker at, I'm sitting in my bunker at Blue Hill Farm uh, which I uh, Amazing. I'm really missing out. I'm sorry. For Where that. you do your magic, which is fantastic. So I'm going to be, as I was saying, uh, playing the role of moderator here. We're going to be talking about three things. We're going to talk about the stone barns evolution. And for those of you who don't know where the stone barns are, they're in Westchester County near Tarrytown, New York. Uh, then we're going to talk about food systems and oceans. And then finally, we're going to talk briefly about storytelling as a force for change in this field. So uh, let me begin because I do have maybe the, yes, not maybe, I do have the longest relationship of any of the three of us to the Stone Barns. And it goes back to my childhood, which was a while ago. And in those days, we called these very Stone Barns the Farm Barns. And there was a connection between the farm barns and here on MDI, because my grandfather, who was wonderfully alive at the time, John D. Rockefeller Jr., uh, didn't like to miss a week of his dairy milk. Uh, and so he had a truck that came up from Tarrytown to Seal Harbor twice a week. And we got fresh eggs and milk and cream and buttermilk twice twice a week. I, I think maybe he could have bought locally here, but uh, that, that movement was not as strong as it has become. And I'll never forget how wonderful that was. He also obviously was very tied into stone as a building material, something which he is well known for up here, either the edges of the carriage roads or the beautiful uh, bridges that exist here. And it was an amazing stone barn. And what to do with it, or a series of stone barns in Westchester. And so what to do with it. So I'm going to call on you, Susan, to have you talk next about the evolution of the stone barns, because Sue, for at least the last 10 years, has been on the board of what became the Stone Barn Center for Food and Agriculture. So take it away, Sue. So thank you, David. And Dan, we miss you. And hopefully next summer, you will be with us. So um, anyway, great to see you on the screen. And, and hello to everybody here. And thank you for taking the time for being with us uh, for this last session at COA. And um, you know, just to think about you know, food system change and the acceleration of that change. I grew up in Westchester and I remember having the milkman go up our driveway and drop off glass bottles of milk and eggs and butter um, and also going to a local farm which is now a clustered development, housing development. So just the acceleration in my life um, you know, it was pretty astounding. And I think probably all of us have stories that we can tell about that transition. Um, I wanted to also say that one of the most profound sort of shifts for me was in college, reading Wendell Berry's The Unsettling of America. And if you have not read it, um, it's just one of the most profound books um, on the unsettling of America and the dismantling of, of food and the whole notion of the culture of agriculture as compared to the business of agriculture. Um, and, you know, my entree, you know, into sort of the questions that sort of continue to um, be part of my daily life um, really happened through the interest in food systems and also environmental studies. And I spent three years in the Alaskan Arctic doing um, agriculture and fisheries work where I saw firsthand the Inuit culture pretty much living a subsistence um, 
about 80% of their food came from uh, hunting and fishing. Um, so I'm just very interested as we look at this acceleration of culture, you know, what are the lessons uh, that we can learn? So I'm very honored that I've been on the board of Stone Barns, and I just wanted to give a little context. Um, and I think that actually Elliot talked a little bit about this, but the initial goal of Stone Barns was to make the beauty and agricultural heritage of the property um, that the Rockefellers had in that region accessible to the public, establish a dynamic campus of farmer chefs and educators working to reconnect the local community to ecological food culture and farming, bring innovation to our regional uh, food system, and also to look at a no waste, and as Dan will say, nose to tail philosophy of using all components in the farm ecosystem. And with so many changes occurring uh, to address food system change, we're really fortunate to have you, Dan, and also Jack Algier, who runs the farming, the Stone Barns, uh, part of, of the Blue Hill Stone Barns relationship, to really create openings for really deep experimentation and culinary delight to take place. And um, what I'd like to do is leave it to Dan to really speak about the unique marriage of the farmer and chef, and also the pivot of Blue Hill Stone Barns because of the pandemic, and Dan's uh, really brilliant resourced program for at-risk farms during the pandemic, and the startling findings of our research on food and regional farm insecurity. Um, and I also want to mention that all of this was compounded by the Black Lives Matter movement that brought us head on into addressing the DEI issues um, through the creation of a chef residency program, um, which again, Dan will be talking about, and the notion and awakening of gastro diplomacy, you know, building bridges across food cultures and deeper learning through the celebration of food cultures. So, Dan, it's on to you. I love gastro diplomacy. I never heard that before. That's that awesome. in a digital newsletter. I liked I it. It was from it. Food Tank. Oh, really? That's great. Uh, well, thank you for, for that introduction. And thank you, Elliot. I don't know if you're still around, but yeah. I'm cooking today because of Elliot Coleman. Uh, you know, there's no, no, nothing else. I didn't have a grandmother that that I was, you know, at the by the stove with. No, I was Elliot. I mean, I was. I remember the day I was in college, and I, you know, I always was in the library, not working, just like uh, wasting time to kind of reading stuff that I was interested in. I, I was terrible at, at discipline, but I there in the library was Elliot Coleman's uh, Four Season Farming, uh, and I, I read, the, and I just remember I was, I was I was a cook at that point, and I was interested in Blue Hill Farm, which is where I am. It's my family farm and it's cold weather, like Maine, you know, most of the year. And here was this, this like amazing writer, clearly a brilliant farmer saying, yeah, you could, you could farm productively, deliciously, nutritiously, 12 months of the year. I was like, there's no, I can't believe that. It was really a revolutionary idea at the time. Today we, we, uh, you know, we have become more localized, we become more regional, we become more local. And so this is, this is, uh, you know, less um, uh, 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 seemingly profound. But back to 30 years ago, this was, he was, Elliot was the cutting edge. And for me personally, was why I got into food, really. Um, and, and why I started thinking about local food systems, because I was like, there's a way to do this and do it well 12 months of the year, because look at this guy. And, um, and I introduced Elliot to the Rockefeller family because we were uh, uh, promoting local agriculture. How could you not uh, include Elliot in a conversation about local agriculture 30 years ago? You couldn't. He's really the godfather of that. And Maine has an icon uh, that has uh, spread these ideas around the world. That's, you know, it's not, not uh, an overstatement. Uh, so much of much of my cooking career and what I believe in really stems from that moment in the library when I was reading this book. And I think you know, so it's sort of like a curtain comes down, it's a before and after moment. So I remember it very clearly. And I remember the introduction of Elliot to Stone Barnes and this thing he was talking about with the fields at Stone Barnes became, you know, why I think Stone Barnes has been 
so successful from a farming point of view is he was really looking at what fields were most fertile and what could they, how could we transform these fields uh, into the most productive farmland? And boy, we needed that kind of consulting, and it's it's become our in our DNA, uh, thanks to Elliot. So um, Sue, I'll just answer your um, uh, comments by saying that that during COVID we shut down uh, Blue Hill, the restaurant. We shut down the campus of Snow Barns. Uh, and we reimagined uh, the relationship between the restaurant and Stone Barns uh, to uh, uh, to rethink some of the things that we've been doing for 20 years. And I say that uh, in the refreshing light. And you you point out that in, during COVID it was it is it is and was that terrible um, uh, moment, scary moment, and and, and depressing moment, uh, and and you had Black Lives Matter happening and the awakening of understanding uh, on my part, but on everyone's part that um, we uh, we have so much inequity uh, in in our food history in this country uh, that uh, it needs we need to better understand it. Uh, and so uh, we launched this program. Uh, Sue was at the forefront of it uh, in advocacy with me of turning Stone Barns over to other voices. And we started to look at chefs uh, from around the world uh, who, who lost their stoves during COVID uh, and who presented a different uh, a, a way forward for food, you know? And, and I have a very Eurocentric viewpoint of uh, food and, and delicious food and healthy food and healthy food systems. But what I wanted to learn and what we have learned over this last year is these, these voices uh, from from cuisines and indigenous foodways and heritage foodways that have taught us a tremendous amount. And if I can take one takeaway from that, if I take one takeaway from that, because there's so many, if I take one takeaway, it's the relationship between food and health and, and environmental health. It's one subject. And what you begin to, you know intuitively, but what you see up close with these chefs that we have had, we've had a chef from North Africa, from, from West Africa, We've had chefs from Chile. We've had uh, a chef from uh, from indigenous chef from from Mexico, from New Mexico. We've had a chef from Mexico, um, and currently we have a chef who's relooking at uh, the immigrant influence on soul food. But if you if you look at all of these uh, uh, cultures and cuisines, what you come away with, among many things, but I'm going to point to one, is the connection between food and health. It's it's indistinguishable. We started the residency program with this West African chef, the amazing Shola Olaniola, who was a, an amazing chef from Philadelphia. But what he brought to the table as I studied it was that the best doctors historically in West Africa, up until the 1920s, 30s, the best doctors were the best cooks. No difference. There was you, healthfulness was about food. And the westernized conception of that, that was very different. It's about intervention. It's about you get sick and then you you get healthcare. Uh, but what you learn from these indigenous cultures and West African, I think, says it so strongly, is that it's preventative. And what Elliot taught me uh, more than any other farmer that I've ever read or, or uh, learned from is that's the, the ticket to the health ecosystem. It's prevention. And if you are in a soil um, uh, raising a healthy soil environment, you're raising a healthy plant. Plant doesn't need intervention. It's strong enough. That was a, that when I read that too in the library, I thought, God, that's a crazy simple thought. Uh, turns out to be very true. Lucky for me, it also means that it's a delicious vegetable. A strong vegetable, a nutrient dense vegetable is also a delicious vegetable. Very interesting. And 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 what is so revelatory is that it's not new. And that it's about every culture and cuisine throughout history has understood it. It's the westernized conception of food that takes food and health and set, it's a bifurcation. And intervention is that, and that's exactly what's happened in agriculture uh, in, the, in the idea that we now grow food to intervene. It's a chemical environment, whatever it is, it is an intervention. Instead of uh, an environment much like Elliott's farm and now Stone Barn's farm, that is about growing healthy soil for healthy plants for delicious food and nutrition. So we learned from 
some great uh, chefs over the last year uh, to help deepen our connection to that uh, commitment to good food and health. Uh, and I hope we can continue it because it's been a, an amazing um, uh, 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 venture and, and one that will uh, influence my cooking for the rest of my life. Susan, I'm back to you. <laughs> great, wonderful. Wonderful, Dan. And I can report that Darren's sprinkler system is working here. Uh, the rain is falling upon this beautiful tent and sprinkling all of uh, the grasses and uh, other vegetables around here in a way that it's done a little more this July than, than usually, I have to say. <coughs> so uh, the next topic we're going to talk about is food and oceans. Uh, and I'm going to start out. Uh, there are many reasons, obviously, to love Maine, but uh, none more than its seafood, I think. And, uh, but there's a great big question, what does the future hold for seafood in Maine? And uh, very, very important questions. Twenty years ago, I was fortunate enough to be a member of the Pew Oceans Commission that decided that we, the scientific community, knew too little. Um, can everybody here in the back, even with the, with the rain, we're all good, um, that uh, the scientific community knew too little about the functioning of the oceans, especially with regard to the living systems of the living creatures, many of which uh, are an important part of our diet. And we took three years and issued a report. Uh, I was part of that commission and the editorial group. And it was a, an extraordinary experience. We studied both the oceans and the Great Lakes. Um, and uh, after doing that, I decided that these issues were so important. Uh, and as a sailor, frankly, I'd been ignorant about what I like to say went on under the keel. Uh, and I found out so much, and I felt I wanted to tell my f fellow sailors what, uh, what was going on down there, what I had learned from these three years of study, and started something called Sailors for the Sea. I see a number of you who were nice enough to be members of Sailors for the Sea, which 12 years after founding uh, migrated into becoming a program of Oceana, an organization that Susan already sat on the board of and that has a global perspective on the health of the seas. So it is, it is so vital that we who are amateurs, as well as we who are scientists, and thank heavens for places like COA that put a lot of emphasis on understanding oceans, that we understand and appreciate better what is going on in the dynamic Gulf of Maine where the last I saw uh, it's four degrees warmer than it was only a few decades ago, which is a, a, a dramatic uh, change to the environment for those creatures that live within it, especially the ones that are born within it. So Sue, I would love it if you would tell us more about what Oceana is doing uh, today and especially it's Save the Ocean, Feed the World campaign. Um, so, um, I've been on the board of Oceana over 10 years. It's a great organization. It's the only global nonprofit that's solely focused on ocean protection. And our theory of change is that we work country by country and we enforce fishing regulation, we minimize bycatch, and we protect fish habitat. And some of the seminal research that we have done about 10 years ago was looking at climate change overlays and realizing that um, if we do not protect the bounty of our oceans, we will have more uh, forests chopped and cut down for industrial agriculture. So there is a climate imperative that we keep our oceans bountiful. Um, and the good news is, is that wild fish is, you know, you don't have to feed them. They're part of the ocean ecosystem. They do not require 
uh, or they require minimum water input, unlike agriculture, and over a billion people rely on fish protein uh, for their major source of getting those micronutrients. Um, and about two billion people are micronutrient uh, uh, insecure, um, mothers and children with you know, childhood stunting and you know, all the problems that come from not getting adequate uh, micronutrients into the diet. So Oceana is working on a campaign. It is Save the Oceans and Feed the World, looking at ways that we can continue to keep the bounty of our wild fish, uh, you know, plentiful so that we can make sure that we have at least a billion meals every day available um, for the poor and most vulnerable. So, um, you know, very honored to be on that board. And I think if you look at the whole sort of um, interplay of the conversation on food security, often uh, fish is left out of the conversation. Um, so I'm hoping that we can bring it back in because it's a vital part of balancing uh, future uh, nutritional needs as the world reaches 9 billion by 2050. Yeah, so thanks. And um, obviously Stone Barns is a land-based uh, institution, but seafood is an important element, Dan, of your menus. So I'm wondering, how do you assure sustainability in the food chain from which you select your fish and shellfish and perhaps sea vegetables? How do you do that? How do you assure your customers that you've got the best and it is what it is labeled as? Well, we're direct with fishermen. I mean, that's the key is, is to uh, buy directly from boats and to pay a premium uh, for fish that are caught in the right way because uh, it costs more. Uh, if you're trawling for fish versus uh, lining for fish, you're, go you're, you're going to have less bycatch, you're going to have less damage on the ocean floor, and you're going to have, in fact, much better fish because you're going to get fish in prime condition. And that's what we pay for. And so there are ways to uh, go about uh, protecting the ocean and keeping the right kind of fishermen in the water. Um, the, and and uh, I think it comes down to paying just a little bit more for seafood uh, and making sure that these uh, fishermen uh, get the proper price for the proper kind of fishing uh, that they're doing. Uh, and then the second thing is to celebrate the fish by making sure that we don't serve on our plates six or seven ounces uh, of protein, of fish filet, with a little vegetable, a little grain on the side. Uh, because no matter how sustainable you are in your buying practices with fishermen, if our plates are uh, unbalanced to what the ocean, the carrying capacity of the ocean can uh, give us, it doesn't matter, uh, it all disappears. So the second half of sustainability is not just making sure that the right fish are coming out of the, right, out of the ocean at the right time from the right fishermen. The second half of it is that we create a food culture uh, where we celebrate the entirety of the fish, the fish skin, the fish bones, the fish meat, and we spread the nutrition and the flavor of fish uh, uh, throughout your diet. And uh, what we need to get away from is a westernized conception uh, not just of, uh, of animal protein, beef, chicken, uh, uh, and, and, and pork, uh, that centers our plate with a hulking piece of protein, uh, that same rule applies to fish because there is not enough fish in the sea uh, for a popula global population that uh, demands protein in the way that we do. Um, so one of the great things to tie back to the residency program that we've done at Stone Barns for last year is to understand up close from these chefs how cultures have dealt with this dilemma uh, over the past uh, several thousand years. And it turns out, not surprisingly, that nobody, nobody in their right mind, cultural right mind, would serve a six or seven ounce piece of protein twice a day, seven days a week, fish or chicken or beef or anything. That's an Americanized conception uh, of a plate of food uh, and, and an expectation for uh, for your lunch and dinner twice a day, seven days a week, as I said. So, so one of the great um, lessons uh, of looking back at 
these uh, cuisines and, and cultures is to understand how did they deal with um, uh, treating the earth or the oceans in a way that sustained itself, regenerative is one of the ways we describe it today, uh, that allows the next generation to um, uh, to have the same kind of pleasures and nutrition that we have. Uh, and part of that is to create uh, dishes and a pattern of eating and a cuisine that balances both what we take from the ocean, what we take from land in a way uh, that uh, uh, spreads the protein in our in our diet. And so you will never see uh, a cuisine uh, unless it's a celebration, unless it's a particular holiday or a particular moment um, in the calendar year, you'll never see a cuisine uh, where a hulking piece of protein centers a piece of plate except Western eyes conception of, of a plate of food. So that that you know that just understanding uh, and by the way, it, this isn't about giving up. You know, this is about giving up uh, big, you know, pleasure in fish. Uh, I mean, look, Chinese food, Indian food, um, uh, peasant French food, Italian food, they all have fish, uh, especially on the coastline, they have fish as part of their diets. We don't actually look at those and say, oh, those are cuisines I wouldn't want to eat. <laughs> no, we actually celebrate them. Uh, in America, we celebrate them, unfortunately, by making protein, uh, uh, giving protein its center stage, where in fact, uh, in every culture, uh, protein is is uh, appropriately um, uh, positioned as a supporting actor to your diet, and that is the key uh, moment for Stone Barns now as we move forward. And everyone knows what farm to table is, and people know the disasters that agriculture is uh, producing on our agriculture and our ecosystems and our environment. That's very clear. What we need to do now is translate, how do we eat in a food culture that's exciting and celebratory? And the lesson of last year and looking at these, these historical cuisines, and we don't need breakthrough technologies. We don't need to give up meat or fish uh, to save the oceans or save our grasslands. No, we just need to um, uh, uh, break with, not break through. We need to break with uh, some traditions that are Americanized, new, and, uh, and, and create a kind of carrying capacity on the earth that, that is impossible to sustain. So I think the future of, of doing things in the right way uh, is to, uh, for, as food is concerned and agriculture is concerned, is to create a food culture that is exciting and delicious uh, and that respects that carrying capacity, whether it's the oceans or our land. So when- oh, I was just gonna say, and yeah, if, if, if anyone has not read The Third Plate, it really outlines beautifully a lot of what Dan's talking about. And I think the future of, of food will be defined by what we put on our plate. And, you know, those- Thank you, Sue, for the plug. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> so for anybody in the audience who's having trouble, I think Dan is saying with portion control, come to Blue Hill Restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, and, you know, Dan, you were talking before about one of the wonderful chefs whom we enjoyed uh, in the spring coming from West Africa. And one of the great problem areas uh, from the fishing point of view is actually off the coast of West Africa because nations, especially some European and Asian nations, are so overfishing uh, the West African uh, fishing zone, the 200 mile uh, fishing zone, some illegally and some otherwise, that it is just devastating the, uh, that food source uh, along West Africa. And Sue, I wondered whether you might say a word about Global Fishing Watch, because there are, there are ways to control what the, especially industrial uh, fishing fleets are doing, and Oceana is very involved with that. And, and I think that gets down to, you know, we have the Internet of Things. We have the ability to use smart technology to monitor water use and, you know, really create better efficiencies in agriculture. But with regard to uh, Global Fishing Watch, it was a initiative with Oceana, Google, and a software company called SkyTruth, and it... it it shows an almost real-time fishing fleet activity. So you can monitor illegal fishing and actually, um, you know, penalize and, and, uh, 
and, and make sure that those fishing fleets um, are accountable um, for any kind of illegal fishing. Um, and that's a huge game changer, especially for the oceans, because we need that transparency. And if you can't have people policing the oceans, um, you, don't, you can't have enough ships out there doing it, right. but with technology, right. you can actually have sort of, you know, the big brother of technology looking um, to see what's going on in terms of the, the bad players. Great, wonderful. So we'll turn to our third topic, which is the role of storytelling uh, in, in food and the future of food. So Sue, as a filmmaker, how do you see the role uh, a filmmaker and the founder of Musings, which is a digital newsletter. How do you see the role of the media uh, as tools of advocacy for the healthy food of tomorrow? So I think stories are everything. Um, I think that the master class on, on TV, you know, YouTube, the most popular classes are the cooking classes. So I keep thinking if you can get, you know, add value and really good content to the fact that everybody loves to cook, but you add a sustainable lens to that, that would be one thing to do. But I think that um, I'm sure many of you have seen there's so many documentaries and um, newsletters. I get a lot of uh, digital newsletters. Um, my digital newsletter looks at innovators and activists, um, you know, really looking for solutions and responsible innovation to solve some of the problems, especially in, in the food system. Um, in terms of, you know, films, I think they, they can do a lot to illuminate the issues and they have to be entertaining. And, you know, to me, I just, it's, it's sort of startling to me that we can't get more good storytelling. And I was just like, headline, okay, this would be a headline. Health impacts are the biggest hidden cost of the food system, with more than $1 trillion per year in health-related costs paid by Americans, with an estimated $604 billion of that attributed to disease, diseases such as hypertension, cancer, and diabetes, all linked to diet. Now, I would think that would catch everybody's attention. It's a little bit of what Dan was talking about, that if we you know, the good chefs and, you know, they're the food is medicine. Those are the doctors. That's the prevention. And why we can't get that information out front and center so that we can transform ourselves and work toward the health of ourselves and the planet. Um, and I think that storytelling will be key. I think, you know, I just want to applaud the efforts of, of COA doing this week-long series and um, you know, Stone Barnes is looking to create a broadcast center with Dan and the, the different people at Stone Barnes and Blue Hill telling the stories of food and the culture of food. And I just think, you know, the more we can do that and celebrate what connects us to each other and to our own cultures, the better. So I think it's one of the most important things we can do. And I don't, I don't know if Dariush Masafarian is here. I don't know if he... But, um, you know, the Tufts Innovation Institute is doing great work. Um, I know that Neva Goodwin is here and doing really interesting work on restoration. Um, and so I think that we need to look at the, eco the economics and we need to tell the stories, give the facts. Science has to lead in these discussions along with really good entertaining stories. Yeah, that's great. So, uh, Dan, uh, as we know, you're widely sought after as a speaker, TED Talks, conferences, and, and et cetera. And I'm wondering what percent of your time do you actually take away from the kitchen and the gardens to do this? And how important is it for you to continue to, to be public in this way? Well, 99% of my time is behind the stuff. I got my head stuck on a walk all day. I don't, I'm not, I'm not out there. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I love what, what I love about Stone Barns is that it, it has a bully pulpit to talk about these issues. I think all chefs are talking about these issues. I mean, I, I don't think I'm saying anything that any, you get a chef in a room, you get five chefs in a room, everybody, you get a hundred chefs in a room, everyone's agreeing on the same thing. We know good flavor. We curate that stuff all night. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's like flavors under siege. You know, that's what's happening. And and the more we put chefs in charge, uh, 
the more, you know, we're in charge because deliciousness gets a seat at the table. When deliciousness gets a seat at the table, sort of Susan's point, you know, this whole thing is that this, this whole movement, everything we're talking about is, is pleasure, hedonism. That's so great. What, what movement can you name, David, that has a, it as its, uh, you know, coat of arms, pleasure and hedonism, you know? It's like the environmental movement's all about giving up stuff. You got to give up the, the, the religion. You got to give up everything to get your salvation. It's just, you know, it, food, good food is is about heating, about being greedy, you know. And that's I think that's why the food movement's so exciting, you know. And that's that's the message uh, we, you know, I want to give. I whether I give it behind the stove or give it, you know, in talks, eh, the, it's deliciousness because, you know, at the end of the day, you can complain all you want about American food system. There's a lot to complain about, a lot. But one thing Americans are good at being greedy. We're like great at greed, you know, and we actually figure out a way to pay a little bit more for something when it's when it's pleasurable. It's like one of the great things about us. And that's why the food stuff, you know, the food culture changes so fast in America. Where else does that happen? You know, it's like these ideas that we're talking about, about locality, about regenerate, all the issues related to the ocean, they all become sort of mainstream overnight, you know? I mean, you know, Ellie, I said I was reading Elliot's book 30 years ago, but look, compared 30 years to today, I mean, it's just a, it's a, it's a, uh, an enormous uh, uh, flip change. And that in, anyway, that's overnight. And I, that's because, you know, that wouldn't happen in, that doesn't happen in other countries. You introduce ideas, different foods uh, in America and, and it's, it's, it's like wildfire. That doesn't happen anywhere. Uh, you know, Japan, uh, China, France. I mean, you can't get the food culture to, in part because they have a much more ingrained traditional uh, and evolved food culture. But one of the things that's great about American food culture is that we don't have a culture. And one of the things that changes the need that moves the needle uh, is this this pleasure principle. So I'm I'm rooted on that, and I'm lucky, you know, because I'm we're we're advocating for something that that. Uh, makes people feel good and feel better about themselves and feel better about how the earth is used. And, uh, you know, I I think that's the thing. I think that's the message to go with. You know, I, I, that was the part that I, I really agree with, with Susan, that the facts part, I don't know, facts. I mean, look at the last four years, the facts matter, like facts don't matter. Facts are, facts are, are done. It's, yeah, it's the story and it's the pleasure where I think we'll hit the, the, the most hearts. So Dan, as you're talking, I'm, I'm thinking that with so many changes that um, we try to make uh, in our culture, in our politics, we depend upon young people to be the leaders. And my question is, if young people, people let's say under 20, who may never have tasted a real delicious tomato, are they also going to be in the vanguard of, uh, of the food movement? if they don't know what they missed? Yeah, no, it's the education. That's why Stone Barnes didn't exist. The education is the key. And look, you know, there are many ways to educate. It's in it's in home kitchens, it's in more and more, it's in restaurants. You look at younger generations, they're spending their money more and more in restaurants. They don't have to be high-end white tablecloth restaurants, it's restaurants. And, and that's where people's passions are. That's not necessarily to save the world and the environment and global warming. It's again, it's driven by uh, wanting to know more about where their food's coming from because that is uh, a happier experience. And so the education, I, you know, I, I'm, t- I, I think we should all become, uh, we need to all become, not just think, we all need to become uh, more fluent in what good food is all about, what truly delicious flavor uh, is. You know, I had this experience right here. I'm, I'm sitting here at Blue Hill Farm, which is the dairy farm uh, that my family farm. Uh, but but it reminds me of uh, uh, many years ago. I, I invited um, uh, Chef Alan Ducasse, uh, one of the great greatest chefs, maybe of our generation. Yeah, definitely greatest chef, or maybe the greatest chef in the history, but besides Escoffier, uh, to to Blue Hill. He was in New York, uh, and uh, he was doing a photo shoot actually at Stone Barn. So I invited him to have a bite. He couldn't have a bite. His schedule was too busy. But the secretary told me, hey, "Come for breakfast. Yeah, come for a bite to eat before the filming." It's like seven o'clock in the morning, you know. And I just opened Stone Barns. I was like, "My, you know, besides Elliot, there's nobody who's been more influential like than Alan, Alan Ducasse, you know." So I, I spent three days getting ready to get, bake this bread for him and make this butter actually from the cows that are just outside my window here, uh, grass-fed dairy. Uh, and so, you know, the moment arrives, I, I bake the bread and the, the, the butter is made fresh and 
and uh, you know, Dukas is tasting it in my kitchen. I, 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 you know, I'm telling you a story. It's like yesterday. He's sitting right here. I, I remember it so well. And uh, and you know, he, he he closed his eyes and he took the bite of the bread. And um, yeah, I was kind of holding my breath. And 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 he said, "Oh, magnifique, I mean, exceptionnel." But you could tell, you know, when someone says it, and you're like. Nah, nah, I don't know. Not really. Right. And so I don't know. I, I got, it was that, I don't know why I would ever question Alan Ducasse, but for some reason at that moment, you know, I did. And I was like, chef, I can tell, I don't know you, but I can tell this isn't the best uh, butter that you've ever tasted uh, because, and it's my family farm and I want to learn and I'm still perfecting how these cows eat the grass and what the rotations are. I need, really would love your advice. Yeah, no, no, no. It took me five minutes. I said, I gotta, we, I have to get something out of this because I know you can teach me a lot. And so he said, well, I have one question for you. I said, well, what, what, what is it? He said, um, has it been raining a lot up at Blue Hill Farm in Western Massachusetts? Actually, it had been raining for three straight weeks uh, at Blue Hill Farm. And, uh, what he was saying to me, because our cows are all grass fed, no grain, they rely only on the grass, is that the butter tasted washed out because the milk came from the cows that were eating the grass and the grass had been inundated with rain and therefore the, uh, the butter wasn't as rich and as, as, um, as unctuous uh, as each. I thought it was incredible and uh, incredible to taste that, you know, and, and I complimented him. And then he said, uh, and he started to leave and he turned around to me, he said, I have one other question for you. I said, yeah, he said, was the butter made uh, by hand or was it made in a, in a, in a Robocoop, in a, in a Cuisinart? And that, and he ever so slightly suggested that the butter was made in a Robocoop. And I, even before he answered, I said, no, 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 chef. You know, I only make butter at Blue Hill by hand, of course, because you make an aerobic cook, you don't get that unctuousness, you don't get that richness, uh, you have to do it by hand. And, and he said, oh, and he apologized for suggesting otherwise. And then, uh, and, then he got, and then he started to go, he put his coat on, he's walking out the door, he turned around like Columbo style, and he's like, I have one more question for you. So he, said, um, he said, he said, was the, uh, was the, was the, was the, were the cows pasturing in a field close to the barn or far away from the barn? I didn't even know that was a, I didn't know that was an issue, you know? So I said what I thought, which is what every time I'm here, the cows are right there on the field. So I said, ah, close to the barn. He said, ah, okay. And that was it. It was a very strange uh, a moment. And he said goodbye. And I was like, God, that was so weird, you know? But I was like, the guy got the thing that there was a lot of rain. He could really taste in the butter. Okay, two weeks later, I'm, uh, I'm in the pastry kitchen and across the room at the corner of my eye, I saw the intern making the butter in a Cuisinart. And I went over to the intern and I said, I said, what are you doing? And he looked at me very excited. He said, chef, I've learned a way that's much faster than by hand. I just whip it in a Robocoup. And he had made the butter for Ducasse in the Robocoup. I was like, Jesus Christ, the guy could taste, I mean, he could taste a machine is what that, that not only could taste the weather, he could taste a machine. Okay, two weeks after that, I'm standing right outside this window at Blue Hill Farm and I'm looking at this beautiful pasture. I didn't see any cows. I turned to the farmer, Sean Stanton, who's pasturing the cows. I said, Sean, where are the cows? He said, yeah, it's interesting. I've moved them to the, furthest backfields, which they never pasture on. Uh, they only hay them. Further back as an experiment because they're the least fertilized, they're the weakest grasses, and I want to improve them in the future. So for the last two months, I've just been pasturing on the last, on the back 20 acres. <laughs> so I, I, I the, the Ducasse could taste like field seven and eight out of the butter, you know? And the, the lesson of, besides the weather and the machine, it could taste the freaking field. And, and what that teaches you know, me, and, and, and I stay with me the rest of my life, is what if we could, we'll never be Ducasse, the guy's a Jedi, you know, but, but what if we all could taste a, a little bit more the connection to how things are grown? Oh, it changed the world. Um, and, and to me, that's the message. That's why the work at Stone Barns is so critical, is to introduce people to uh, things grown in the right way and, and the pleasure that's delivered from that. But you have to, you're right, you have to be educated. And, 
um, it's it's much of the work that we're doing. But it's you know it's like a compass in your pocket. It's like, you know you're 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 Christopher Columbus with a with a compass if you have that in your pocket. And that's what that's what I'm driving towards. Anyway, sorry to go on for so long, but that was the no. story that came to mind. <laughs> You know, Dan, I just have to say one thing, like when I go to the meetings, the board meetings at Stonebarns, um, Dan will say to me, what would you like? I'd like to get you a snack. And I'll say, Dan, all I want is bread and water and the butter. And I have to tell you, it is the most delicious bread and butter. And it is one of the highlights, along with everything else that goes on there. But I don't know if we have time just to talk a little bit about the bread project, and um, I'd love to have you talk a little bit about the seed project as well, and just some of the things that we're doing that really speaks to the crux of this transformation in food culture and innovation. Well, part of, I think, what you're referring to, and I think why you like the bread is because we fresh mill the wheat. First of all, the wheat is grown, uh, there, there are varieties of wheat that are bred, they're selected, especially for whole wheat milling, which, you know, sounds sort of obvious, although the truth is for thousands of years, not hundreds of years, thousands of years, we've been selecting uh, wheat seeds uh, to get to the white stuff because that's where the sweetness, supposedly, where the sweetness is. I mean, Roman times, they were take, they were, they were, they were uh, separating the bran from the germ to get that the, the, the endosperm, that white stuff, um, uh, to people who could afford it. Uh, and you know, the 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 wheat over that time frame has gone from wheat that. Uh, uh, makes beautiful whole wheat bread because the bran is sweet and delicious and, and supple uh, uh, in a stone mill to a roller mill, which is how 99.9% .9 of our wheat is produced. Uh, and, and it's bread to be shattered uh, so that the bran uh, uh, is separated very easily from that white stuff. And that's how, and the problem with it, of course, is that the nutrition and I think a lot of the flavor is in that bran and in that little germ uh, inside the endosperm. Uh, the germ is where the oils are. And so fresh milling wheat has become kind of the central focus of our project because, uh, because we're a wheat culture. That's why we're a wheat culture. And uh, westernized civilization was built on wheat. And uh, the problem is we have a nutrition crisis uh, in this country. Uh, and uh, if we can change bread, I, I try and shy, shy away from the idea that there's, there's a magic bullet anywhere because there's not, as we know. Uh, but if you, if you were to wave a wand and, and, get, and be granted one thing, what would the one thing be that you'd want to change? I think it's wheat. In this country, I think it's wheat because bread is just so fundamental and, and cheap and, and accessible, democratized, and, or could be democratized, whole wheat bread. It's very, very actually possible uh, to do it. We need to uh, select the right seed, we need to uh, regionalize bread uh, uh, and we need to treat bread like orange juice so that you are, when you uh, uh, mill bread, it's, it, would, you, would you have a glass of orange juice that was milled uh, three months before? I, I'm sorry, it was squeezed three months before? No, because it, wouldn't, it would taste terrible. Uh, but, but it's the same with wheat. And that's what they're doing. They're, they're, they're killing wheat mummifying wheat and what we're eating is white stuff that actually doesn't taste, it has no flavor. The butter provides a flavor or the, whatever the additive is. And uh, uh, it doesn't provide us with any nutrition. So uh, one thing that I think is that central, and I think Sue would agree with this with the plants for stone barns is try and change wheat culture, try and change bread culture uh, so that we can get back to, uh, and see, I slipped up, see? It's not back to, because what we actually need to say is, we're we're going Jeff Bezos style into the future, you know. It's like back to what our great grandparents ate. No, our great grandparents were trying to get to the white stuff too. They just didn't have the technology that we have now uh, to do it. So actually, what we're doing is a revolution. It's the future of eating, and it's it's to reconceptualize uh, this incredible grain wheat that is Western civilization and make it into something that is more accessible, more nutritious, and infinitely more delicious uh through treating it as a as a as a lot as as a fruit as a as a live uh food uh that needs to be crushed milled uh uh, uh, uh at the moment 
uh, and baked fresh. And it's it's revelatory. And you won't ever go back to white flour. As mo most of you in the audience I know um, uh, love uh, uh, whole wheat bread because there's so much whole, great whole wheat bread in Maine. Uh, the problem is we've had uh, the last 30 years of, uh, uh, or, or we had a movement for whole wheat baking that was not uh, uh, well crafted. And so uh, we have a bad reputation for whole wheat bread, a heavy, a brick, tastes bitter, ugh, I want the white stuff, yeah. But that's bad baking. Uh, it's not the wheat's fault. So um, that's what we're, we're central to our focus uh, as we move forward with Stone Barns because we do not want to be a place that's a cathedral to food and a white tablecloth restaurant to food. Uh, our mission is to democratize uh, these flavors uh, and this nutrition. And I think maybe the best way to do it is through wheat. Wonderful. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Sue. And uh, we now have time for some questions. I think we have about 15 minutes. So uh, there are two microphones circulating. I saw a hand, a couple of hands over there. Thank you, Sean. Thank you all so much. Um, Dan, uh, it's great to hear you talk. Uh, I've been following your work for a few years, big fan. Would love at some point to get down to one of your restaurants uh, and eat. But even if I could get there right now, there's no way that I could afford to eat at one of your restaurants. As Martha Stewart said earlier today, a meal at one of your restaurants with a nice bottle of wine is about you know, $400. That's a month's rent for me. Um, so my question is, you know, how, what do you see the limits of fine dining being in transforming this food culture? And just to contextualize that question a little bit more, um, you know, creating a food culture, in a sense, requires people to have agency over the food that they, they consume. And for most people in the U.S., there's so many systemic barriers to, you know, controlling how food is grown and what food they consume just with, you know, subsidy, agricultural subsidies propping up unsustainable or unhealthy crops or uh, global markets driving down prices, which encourage unsustainable practices or exploitative labor um, and things like that. Um, and so, and there are lots of people working really hard, lots of indigenous people, lots of people of color, lots of working class people working hard to transform food cultures for themselves, but there are so many systemic barriers in the way. So I guess, what do you see the limits of fine dining being and what do you think needs to happen beyond fine dining to, to you know, affect this very necessary change in food culture? Dan? I'm glad you cushioned this by saying I, you were a big fan of mine because uh, that was, it was <laughs> a great way. To, that's a good lesson in how to communicate diplomatically, uh, which I never do. So I compliment you on that. Um, I, in fact, I have on my screen um, uh, next to the, the looking at you asked that question, ironically, uh, is a schedule for the fall at Stone Barns. And I just want to read it to you. This is straight. I'm not, I, I would flash it on the screen, but I don't know how to share the screen. So I'm going to, you're going to trust me that this is a schedule. Uh, and, and I'm, what is your name? Oh, you don't have the microphone anymore. Okay, I'll call you Dominic. Uh, um, Dominic. Dom, so Dominic, uh, I, I'm going to just run you through uh, the opportunity for you to visit Stone Barns on Saturday, uh, October 9th. Okay, uh, and and here goes. You you're going to enter Stone Barns uh, at uh, at 11 o'clock in the morning uh, for a tour uh, with a cook and a farmer. Uh, and uh, that tour is going to last an hour and a half. Uh, it's, we're looking at it being 15 bucks. Uh, and you're going to get a deep dive into all the work that is happening around the farm and how those vegetables and grains uh, and meats are used in the kitchen. It's a fantastic tour. We've done it in 2019 a little bit, and we're going to do it souped up uh, in, in the fall. Uh, you're going to leave that tour at 11 o'clock, uh, and you're going to go and have a, a tray lunch uh, the tray lunch is going to be uh, $35. Uh, and the tray lunch is going to be all the ingredients that you just toured. And by the way, all the ingredients I use in the kitchen. So I'm not, I'm not fluffing off, you know, the bad stuff. To do, it's the same thing. Okay. So you're getting the exact same food coming from the exact same kitchen reimagined for a lunch tray, essentially, uh, at 35 bucks. If you want to have a glass of wine with that, you can upgrade. Uh, that's on the schedule. There's there's room for you to. If you don't want to do that, you have some water with the wheels. Fine. Ducasse would say you better go for the wine, uh, and you'll have a, a tasting tour uh, of the of the physical tour that you just went on. Uh, at the end of that, uh, since you are coming from Maine, I'm imagining that you've invested the drive and you want to stay for a minute. So you're going to now enter another tour called the 2.0 Experience Tour. The 2.0 Experience is a peek at 
where Stone Barns will be in 20 years. And now we're going to take you along six stops at Stone Barns. And this is going to start in the greenhouse, and you're going to taste a new variety, unnamed, unnamed, a trial variety of squash that has been growing in our greenhouse that hopefully, with the advocacy of people like you, will become a mainstream squash filled with beta carotene, filled with the kind of flavors you only dream about at Thanksgiving. Uh, and that will be the first part of your tour. You'll move from there into the, our bar, and you will have a beverage experience called botanical beverages that will take all the wild uh, uh, foraging that the cooks have done and the herbs and create a bar program for the future. You're getting a little taste of what that uh, will, will be like. And you can go from there into the kitchen, I'll say hello to you. Uh, and uh, you will have a taste of a ferment or a preserve from the farm into winter that we're working on. Uh, and you will move from there into the bakery and you're gonna taste a 100% whole wheat uh, a bread, a wheat for the future, an unnamed variety of wheat that we're trialing at Stone Barns and seeing how it performs agronomically in the field and seeing how it performs in the bakery. And there's a literally a Venn diagram uh, that if it performs well, meaning it yields well and therefore isn't a, an heirloom or a hyper expensive wheat and performs well in the bakery where the flavor is good and it's going to knock your socks off, that's what you're going to taste. And you're going to go from there into an arts and ecology room where you're going to learn all about how we utilize parts of the farm into uh, an artistic expression uh, for the future. That tour is going to cost you 60 bucks and it will last one hour and 45 minutes. And now you have a choice. Your choice is to come in to Blue Hill and have that $400 experience that Martha Stewart uh, uh, said, uh, or you have the choice to go to a Blue Hill Stone Barns Pinchos experience, which is uh, a snack experience of more flavors from around the farm that are hors d'oeuvres and a little light meal, also with a glass of wine, this time included at dinner, and that will cost you $45. So that will end your day at Stone Barns. So for the grand equivalent of about 180 bucks, uh, you will have spent 50% less than a day at Disney World. You will have learned 50 times more than you will at Disney World. And you will have a not only a taste of the present, but a taste of the future. Uh, that is most of how people who visit Stone Barns have experienced it in the past, but in the future will experience it. Uh, so I, I, I hope I don't sound defensive. Uh, I only sound, I, I hope I only sound the way I feel, which is the future uh, of this movement is relying on people like you to take that full tour. Uh, and yes, you're going to have to invest some money because it's not free. It's subsidized, but it's not free. Uh, but I think the pleasure uh, principle and in education you get out of it will be well worth uh, the journey and the investment. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, time for a couple of oh, more. I just wanted to add that there is, um, there are a lot of funders that are subsidizing uh, the chef residency so that there is affordability for people to come and experience, uh, you know, the, the food and the experience at Blue Hill, as well as what Dan just talked about. So, you know, the hope, Dominic, is that you can bring your whole, you know, group of friends with you and really have that transformative experience. Great. There was a question over there. Maybe Neva. I, I want to ask about gluten. Uh, you've been talking about wheat and whole wheat, and I just recently finally caved in and gave up gluten, and I'm miserable. Uh, and I keep missing the breads I used to love, but I feel a lot better. And so the question is, how can you provide good grain-based, wheat-based products without the kinds of gluten that are making so many of us sick? Did you get that, Dan? I did get that. And first of all, I'm sorry you've given up bread. Uh, I, I, I would be uh, as uh, depressed and, and um, anxious uh, about wanting bread as you are uh, without it. Um, here's, here's my answer to you. Um, I don't know what kind of bread you were eating, uh, which, is, which is key because 
um, the gluten that you're talking about uh, is uh, we have selected wheats uh, for very large molecules of gluten. Um, why have we selected wheat for very large molecules of gluten? Because most wheat, most wheat uh, is uh, produced, i.e. baked, uh, in large production facilities. And when you're baking bread in large production facilities, you have very large abusive machinery. Uh, and it literally uh, 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 hurts, damages the wheat proteins. And so the gluten structure is there to give it the cement that the wheat won't break down under the abuse of high-speed mixers and incredible amounts of commercial yeast and the high and quick bake uh, that happens on all commercial bread. Uh, so that gluten intolerance that has emerged in the last 30 years, or really the last 10 years, is in large part based on the selection process for wheat that is meant to make commercial baking much easier. The problem is if you are eating at a local bakery in Maine, you are most likely eating the same wheat. There is, there is no difference. Unless that bakery is using wheat from an older variety of wheat, either it's heirloom or pre-1950 wheat, uh, I imagine, I'm willing to bet that your intolerance to gluten, the way you feel after having a slice of bread would be infinitely different. Uh, number two reason, number two uh, um, thing with the bread that, that it is happening at Stone Barns uh, is we are very, uh, not only very aware of that molecule size of gluten, because we don't need it. We're not abusing our wheat. We're not abusing our bread. Uh, and our proteins are lower and our gluten molecules are less abrasive for our system to digest. Uh, but number two is we ferment the bread. We are, we are allowing the bread uh, to create its own yeast and its own bacteria to break down the gluten, pre-digest the glutens, so that when you eat the bread, your body doesn't struggle with trying to digest glutens. If you look at gluten under a molecule, under a microscope, it's a whopper of a molecule. And you can understand why people have a hard time digesting it. So one of the tricks is A, select wheat that is meant for less abusive baking, and number two, Make sure that the, the bread that you eat is, is uh, ferment, is broken down, that, that, uh, that the ability of microbes to pre-digest wheat is the ticket to the future of delicious bread. Great. Over here. Uh, David and Sue and Dan, thank you so much. This has just been an absolutely fascinating discussion and so many important messages. And I really wanted to shout out like amen so many times when you said so many critical things. Um, the question for you, Sue, uh, I hear you have a new product called Muse's Neck Potion Number no. 9. And I wonder if you would talk a little bit more about it. Well, thank you. Um, out of COVID, David and I spent how many months, five months? upstate at our farm in the Hudson Valley. And I think all of you know that um, we spent a lot of time on our digital devices. And I have always, I had an early neck injury and was just constantly feeling like I wanted something to alleviate the neck pain, but also have a really beautiful scent profile. So I worked with um, my sister-in-law, Abby's farm uh, called it's, it's Mud Creek Farm, but it's a company called Hudson Hemp, and spent about eight months um, creating two scent profiles with the highest amount of CBD um, in a product so that you could have a very beautiful scent that would lift your spirits, but also provide relief from incessant uh, digital device use. So uh, <laughs> it's on the market in a soft launch and will be, you know, in the market and launching in late September. You take it before. Sue, or that's dinner. great. This is great news. Yeah, this I'll is send great. it to you. I didn't know. I didn't know nothing about that. Sue, you're in the neck yeah. business. I had no idea. Yeah, I just figured there was nothing on the market that had a really great scent profile. It was usually kind of medicinal, 
So they, there's an earthy scent and a floral scent, and then it has 750 milligrams of CBD and anti-inflammatory herbs, and it, and it works. I've been getting great feedback on it. Maybe, maybe we should co-launch a, a, a whole wheat bread scent. I like, actually, I have to tell you, many so. of the experimental uh, formulas smelled very much like yeast. <laughs> so it took a while to get more into the, the other scent, but let's talk. Mm. Darren, we have time for one more. Yeah, okay. Maybe we're done. Oh, there's one there. Thank you. Hi, Chef um, and Susan and David. Such a big fan. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your Young Farmers program. I know some of the people like William Patia Brown and David Bolin are some of my heroes and they're, they just do it on their own and they both attended your event and were so appreciative. And I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about the status of Young Farmers across America and mm -hmm. thank you so much for mentoring them and giving them, sharing your knowledge. Thank you. Well, Sue, I should let you uh, talk about the Young Farmers because you're on the board and the advocate for that program. Uh, I'll just say that uh, you know we when we launched Stone Barns, uh, we launched Young Farmers Conference immediately uh, because of the crisis uh, in the average age of farmers around the country. And if we're going to really do the kinds of things that we're talking about today, we need the farmers to do it. Uh, interestingly, uh, before Sue weighs in on this, interestingly. The Young Farmers Conference, we are adopt, changing it uh, to a Young Farmers, Young Chefs Conference. Uh, because what's been recognized for 20 years is very much what we've been saying the last hour, which is you can't change agriculture without changing the food culture. You can't. And the last 20 years, the most exciting social movement in America has been farm table movement, but it has not moved the needle of how food is produced. Actually, the big fat cats have only gotten fatter. Uh, so what we need is really the change in food culture to support the kind of farming that you, the farmers, specific farms you just talked about. So the Young Farmers Conference is, is adapting to that in a, in a new way and involving uh, chefs in equal measure. And so it's actually a conversation between chefs and farmers from around the world that I think makes it more interesting and more adaptable to uh, food culture change, which is so desperate. But Sue, I know you have been a big fan of Young Farmers and, and have made it happen. So I want you to yeah, get no, the last I, word. I think, I think you pretty much um, covered it. It's a great program and we will continue in the, I think the intersection and the, the connection between the chefs and the farmers is really crucial. Um, and I just, I just like to say one thing that, you know, being here in Maine, we are so lucky, you know, and David and I rained, it's been raining, but we spent an afternoon picking chanterelles and then sauteing them and putting them in our pasta and picking blueberries. And there's such an incredible culture of land and ocean bounty here. And, you know, just very deep gratitude that, and, and my hope is that COA and the people that are coming out of, of this program, um, as well as, you know, the farmers and chefs program at, at, at Stone Barns, that we have these advocates that will protect um, what is so vital for a food culture that we can celebrate. Um, because as Dan said, it's, it's really what keeps us healthy. It's that local healthy soil and the food that we can grow and the, the fish and um, the resources that we can take from the sea. So I just you know, want to thank COA and just uh, continue to celebrate the bounty um, of this incredible place. Excellent. That's beautiful. Great place. Great, great. Well, thank you all. Thanks so much. For your attention, thanks Darren for the opportunity to be here. Thanks Dan, so sorry you weren't with us in, in person, uh, but it's just been great to have a conversation with you and thanks to all the audience for being here. You know, I smell wheat bread and <laughs> chanterelles and I, I kind of smell a partnership too between Stone Barnes and the college, so. <laughs> work on that later this evening, but I do have a few closing remarks. You got to give me five more minutes or so because um, unlike most people here, like I, I knew nothing about food from age zero to 40. Like that's why I wrote the 
Um, the consider the peanut butter sandwich opening, you know, is based on consider the lobster that, that Ruth talked about. Um, I was a generation Xer, you know, grew up in the suburbs, and so peanut, peanut butter and jelly was my like, that was my go-to uh, until March 10th, 2010. Um, I was, when I was working with World Wildlife Fund, I went out and I was part of the TED conference there, and there were two people that just made my head spin, and one of them was Temple Grandin, and I really wanted to have Temple here, um, but the second was Dan Barber, and uh, how I fell in love with a fish um, really spun my head around, and that experience and my 10 years here as president has made me love food, although I still really hit the peanut butter and jelly pretty hard. But um, Dan, I just wanted to say thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. Um, so it's been fun, right? I think it's been fun. Uh, yeah. We're going we're to have this feedback form. I mentioned that this morning. I want you to tell us what we can do better. Um, I could stand up here for a half an hour and thank everyone, and I'm not going to do that, I promise, but the whole college has put their shoulder behind this, uh, but none more than Sean Keeley, and I wanted to thank Sean for his um, and, I, and I'll conclude, you know, in the, in, in the beginning I talked about like the five pillars of the, of the program and uh, how one of the five was like edification and entertainment, and Dan clearly clearly does that. So I'll end on a, uh, a top 10 things we have learned at the College of the Atlantic Summer Institute, although they're not ranked. My wife Karen said, do not rank them, just say 10, but there are, here they are anyway. Number 10, <laughs> number 10, Chris Kimball does a remarkable job at impersonating Julia Childs, for sure. <laughs> that, was, that was great. Um, if you read, number nine, if you read Michael Pollan's uh, most recent book, Never Ever Plant Poppy Flowers in Your Garden. Don't do that. Um, corn, it's a sacred plant, but it's also one that has been weaponized against us and is poisoning us maybe more than any other food, but now maybe wheat, I don't know. Um, number seven, tipping has, has a difficult, insidious relationship to slavery. And we learned that from Saru. Ruth Reichel, this is number six, has many, many talents, um, including food-related Twitter haiku. Uh, on June 9th, she said, strange misty morning, clouds hang heavy over woods, coffee, cream, warm biscuits, fresh apricot jam, waiting for the sun. That was nice. Um, number five, maybe the biggest hurdle to having more sustainable locally raised meats is the dearth of slaughterhouse facilities. We learned that from alumna Shelley Pingree and alumnus Jenny O'Burton. We learned you can grow a tomato plant 35 feet high, given the right conditions. Number three, I think this is a really fun one, I think, an important one. Food can be a portal for addressing and the healing of these deep and painful wounds of colonialization, slavery, and racism. And then we learned from Dan tonight, I added this one obviously just a few minutes ago. Number two, stop abusing the wheat, damn it. <laughs> stop abusing the wheat. And number one, it's totally fine to use rice as a verb. Like I'm going ricing in about six weeks. I love that. And that was from, that was from Winona LaDuke this morning. So, uh, Pessim Cook. That's where we are. That's what the people of the Dawnland called Mount Desert Island. Um, may we all collectively use food to help heal, get better, heal ourselves, heal the planet. And thank you, Dan, Susan, David, Elliot, and everyone else that's made the fifth College of the Atlantic Summer Institute such a success. Thank you all. Feel free to join us for drinks up on the red bricks.
Thank you, guys. That was great. That was really good.